I mean, I wish that I'm going to reintroduce Tom Kenny, already referred to as the, the grandfather of the arts in Galway. He lived and worked in the street for many years and knows the this side of Galway, most of Galway, inside out. And he's familiar with our neighbours in the cash bath. And he's going to give us a sense of what their life was like and what the world that they lived in, they inhabited, was like. So, Rina Witcher, would you please welcome Mr. Tom Kenny. And Tosa Tom Kenny. Well, uh, we are celebrating two sisters here this evening, Nora and Delia Kelly, who came from Henry Street. Uh, Delia was known as Dillian to one all and sundry, and she married a man called Christy Kelly, uh, who had a house next door to the Spanish Arch. And uh, they got married, they fell in love and got married, and he died, unfortunately, within a few months. So Delia inherited the house, which was known to us, many of us, as the Galway Museum for many years. She and her sister, Nora, moved in next door here. And they opened a restaurant, a cafe, uh, a very exotic place. You can say it was unique. Uh, and uh, they, the menu never changed for the 20 years they were here. They served soup, fruit beans, and chips. The soup was divided into light soup or heavy soup. <laughs> you could have either. Uh, you were often asked which you prefer. The light soup came from on top of the pot. The heavy soup came from <laughs> deep in the pot. There were four tables in this restaurant, and uh, the tablecloths were usually the Irish press, or pages of the Irish press, or the Connacht Tribune, or the Irish Independent. Never, never the Irish Times. <laughs> uh, the J car was honestly like something uh, that would have been invented for a Druid set. There were tea towels everywhere, there were pots in at the back. They started cooking the crew beans very early in the afternoon, and uh, <coughs> But the place never really opened until after closing time. And to tell you the truth, a lot of people would have needed about 10 pints in them to come to the door and all. Uh, I met a man once who told me he, he was a regular there, he absolutely loved it. But he was terrified of eating or drinking anything. Uh, he just sat there and laughed and laughed and laughed at the performances that went on. Uh, the, a friend of mine once, uh, he told me, he, he shifted an absolutely drop-dead gorgeous blonde from Dublin. And he said to her, uh, would you like to come to Galway's first nightclub? Oh yeah, she said, oh yeah, that sounds, yeah, yeah, I would. So in he brought her anyway into Nora and Dillings and uh, they sat down and she said to him, where's the ladies? And he was absolutely <laughs> stumped. There were two doors into this place, one into the kitchen and one onto the street. So he said, you better go up and ask uh, Nora there at the door. So she went up and she whispered into Nora's ear. And Nora opened the door and then in a very loud voice she said, Do you see that man there across the street? Well, you don't go down there at all. That's where the lads go. You go down around the back of McDonald's. No, I wouldn't bother you, don't you? <laughs> And that finished the romance. Uh, it was a hilarious place. Uh, it was probably one of the few restaurants in Galway where you could get boiled soup cold. <laughs> Tommy Feeney uh, told me once of a night he had here. Uh, and Now, Dilling was kind of fond of the boobs. <clears throat> Actually, they were both kind of fond of the booth. I stood in uh, Pat Taft's off-license one Christmas Eve. There was a big queue because there were hardly any off-licenses in Galway at the time. And I was behind Nora. <coughs> and Pat Taft was behind the counter. He was extremely busy. And uh, Nora said, a bottle of padded there, Mr. Taft. Is. And he's putting it into a uh, paper bag. And he said, no, no, just a minute now. Would you ever take the alcohol out of it? <laughs> And he was completely flummoxed. You see, it's for Dilly, it's for Christmas, and she doesn't drink at all. <laughs> but she was fond of it, and she would occasionally imbibe. In fact, nobody was really allowed drink in there. The only 
person I ever heard of who managed at one stage to get a bottle of whiskey in there was Peter O'Toole, the actor. And uh, Nora said, well, seeing as how it's yourself, Mr. O'Toole. <laughs> but I said the two girls had plenty of that bottle as well. But Dilly would start to sing and she would start to play the accordion. It was a very late night place, as Jerry has so eloquently said in his poem. It was a very late night place and uh, 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 when they start to drink, Dilly would start to play the accordion and sing. I am at the boat. You've just heard it there. Yeah. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. But she was singing one night and she was kind of swaying a little bit. <laughs> and she had sort of turned her back on the audience, on the four tables. And Tommy Feeney, who told me the story, said, he said, why don't you sing God Save the Queen, Dilly? <laughs> and she swung around like this. And with the back of her fist, some unfortunate who was sitting on the first table got it right in the puss. Don't mention that bitch in Mrs. Stanton, she said. She was terrific. <laughs> Nora, as I say, was the one at the door. Uh, you had to say who you were. Uh, it was better if you were an accountant or a doctor or even a medical student was allowable as well. But uh, yeah, if you were from the Plata or Chantilly, you were pretty much shy, even though they managed to get in a lot of the time. Shorty Hines was from the West, and the night before he went, emigrated to America, he, uh, he was in here, and uh, Nora says to him, would you ever send us a dress from America? Well, I with Nora. He says, Michael, would you ever measure the two girls? So Michael got a bit of string, and he got the two, and the two women to stand up like this, and he wrapped his string around the two of them, and he says, there you are now. I don't know whether the dress has ever came back or not. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> the atmosphere in this place was just fantastic. Uh, it genuinely was. The crew beans, uh, you'd find it very hard to open your mouth after the crew beans because there was so much fashion. <laughs> but you were kind of satisfied because usually you had about seven pints in you. Anyway, uh, but it was very important. And as I say, there was... Uh, light soup and heavy soup as well. Uh, there was a man at the door once uh, and uh, Nora wouldn't let him in. And he said, sure, all I want was a crew bean to take home. So she took the money in from the through the letterbox and she shoved the crew bean out <laughs> through the letterbox, which was a little bit small, the, the letterbox. I mean. <laughs> So he said afterwards he got a shaved crew bean <laughs> outside the door. Uh, now, the two ladies, they retired in the end. Uh, Dillian was about 78 and was about five or six years younger. And they were just getting old and they could hardly manage, uh, which was an awful shame. And they went out to Merlin Park. They were taken into Merlin Park. And that's when they spent the latter days. And, uh, but. They left behind them this extraordinary legacy of memory, which has been captured beautifully and very eloquently by Jerry Hanbury in his poem. I think anybody who was a student here uh, or who ever visited this place, uh, Nora Krubes, Dillings, the Casbah, I mean, the most exotic name in Galway at the time was the Casbah. The least exotic place in Galway was the most exotic name. Uh, but, Nobody will ever forget it. Now, there might be a few who couldn't remember it, which is a different <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a very, very special place. And I think there's a certain poignancy to uh, a song that Dillian used to sing, one of the songs she used to sing. Actually, when she'd get really jarred and she'd be singing, she'd be standing over the pots and as she was singing, her teeth would fall out <laughs> into the soup. And meanwhile, there'd be a, a, who's out, who's out? Nora would say, it's uh, Surgeon Kenny. Oh, come on in, Surgeon. How would you like a uh, bowl of soup, please? <laughs> and meanwhile, Dilly would be fishing the teeth out of the soup. Uh, I don't know quite what health and safety would have made of it, that they'd never have survived in it. But there was a certain poignancy, I think, to one of the songs that 
they used to sing together in Merlin Park and uh, this was in their later days they were approaching death at this stage uh, and it was uh, Aaron Gabra and it was Dillian particularly who was to sing it Aaron, my country so sad and forsaken in dreams I visit thy sea beaten shore but alas in a foreign land I awaken and sigh for the friends I can meet no more. They always wanted to come back to P Street, to reopen their business, to meet old friends and old buddies, and I think that's why it's so poignant. And you know, it's lovely that we're here. They would be enormously proud of this gathering here today, of that poem at the door, of this kind of celebration of their work. So they have left us a remarkable legacy, and I think we thank them. Yes. And I'd like to propose a toast to Nora and Dilly. Nora and Dilly. Nora and Dilly.